Anna Politkovskaya was murdered outside her Moscow apartment on October 7, 2006. She was shot three times in the body, once in the head. The pistol was left at the scene of the crime, the signature of a contract killing. She was a journalist. The then president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, made no comment on her death for three days and then argued in effect that the Russian authorities had no reason to have her killed since she had minimal impact on domestic politics. The view put out by the Kremlin was that Politkovskaya's murder was engineered by forces in the West to embarrass Russia in the eyes of the world. The following year, reviewing Politkovskaya's last book in the New York Times, Andrew Meyer wrote, quote, Russia under Putin, Politkovskaya believed, is a diseased state. In this final work, she gave us a near stenographic record of her country's descent. The emergence of a petro-state fuelled by rising oil prices, as well as a willingness to sacrifice civil liberties along with, when, when necessary, its own citizens. The set pieces in her diary read like an unfiltered news feed that reveals the greater malaise. Putin at a Kremlin round table encircled by cowed former dissidents. And the rise of Ramzan Kadyrov, described as Politkovskaya, as the deranged and virtually brain dead lunatic warlord Putin tapped to rule Chechnya. In 2009, I raised the subject of Ramzan Kadyrov and his human rights record in my weekly sports column. Why? Because Kadyrov had a starter in the following Tuesday's Melbourne Cup. <laughs> Another horse owned by Kadyrov was expected to run in the following Saturday's Emirates Stakes. And nobody said a thing, except for then Senator Bob Brown. He said if Kadyrov's horse won, it would be the low point in Australian sporting history. He was right. In an article on Politkovskaya in the New York Review of Books in 2008, Amy Knight wrote that Politkovskaya believed she had a mission to report on the dirty war in Chechnya that the Putin regime had launched in the autumn of 1999. By the time of her death, Politkovskaya had made at least 50 trips to Chechnya, a savage and dangerous place that most other Russian journalists avoided. Knight wrote, quote, her subjects were the innocent victims of the war, ordinary civilians, whether Russian or Chechen, whose lives had been ruined by the conflict. She described maimed bodies, burned corpses, the destruction of entire villages. She wrote about hapless Russian soldiers conscripted into the army and sent off to Chechnya, where they were often treated like slaves by their commanders. They witnessed cruelties that went beyond the bounds of normal war warfare and were themselves treated cruelly by the Chechens when captured. The New York Review of Books article described Ramzan Kadyrov as, quote, the violent and corrupt young Chechen whom Putin installed in the Chechen government. As Politkovskaya reported, Kadyrov's militia was and still is notoriously brutal against the resistance kidnapping, torturing, and killing innocent civilians by the hundreds. In early 2000, Politkovskaya had written, quote, I thought that maybe I should not write about everything I see. Maybe I should spare you, the public, all, so that you can continue to enjoy your life, thinking that the army and the new government are doing the right thing in Northern Caucasus. Maybe. But I know for sure that when we wake up, it will be too late. Just two days before her murder, Politkovskaya was interviewed on Radio Liberty about her ongoing investigation of Kadyrov and the crimes committed by his militia, which she had documented with videotapes and photographs given to her by eyewitnesses. Politkovskaya told Radio Liberty, quote, personally, I only have one dream for Kadyrov's birthday. I dream of, dream of him sitting someday in the dock in a trial that meets the strictest legal standards with all of his crimes listed and investigated. 
In an essay written two months before her death and published posthumously in the Washington Post, Polakovskaya wrote, why has Ramzan Kadyrov vowed to kill me? I once interviewed him and printed the interview just as he gave it, complete with all his characteristic moronic stupidity, ignorance and satanic inclinations. Ramzan was sure I would completely rewrite the interview and present him as intelligent and honourable. That, after all, is what they call journalism in Russia today." Unquote. I'm a journalist. Anyone who wants to study the full paradox of journalism in a setting closer to home than Russia should read Hack Attack, journalist Nick Davies' book about the Murdoch-owned News of the World phone-tapping scandal in Britain. The book is a portrait of the cringingly weak, ambitious and vicious types who created and encouraged a media culture in which phone tapping, a practice remarkably similar to blackmail, became acceptable. It is also an unforgettable portrait of the corrupt relationship between the political and media elite in Britain over three decades, and as such it will be read and valued long after the characters in the book are dead. But at the same time as Hack Attack exposed one part of the world of journalism, it is itself the work of a journalist. And that is the paradox of journalism. Journalism is a profession that attracts all types. It attracts shallowly ambitious creatures who soon work out how to rise in corporate media structures. But it also attracts fearless crusaders for the truth. Anna Politkovskaya's former husband described her in this way. Her sense of justice was the focal point of her life. Lying was forbidden. One must always tell the truth. That was the principle she always lived by, and it was precisely what took her to Chechnya. I don't claim to be in the class of people like Anna Politkovskaya, but I do know as a fact that they exist. In 2015, around the world, 72 journalists were murdered for getting too close to truths that certain groups, powerful individuals and governments did not want spoken. 40% of the stories that the murder, murdered journalists were working on involved human rights. In the same year around the world, 199 journalists were in jail, one of them for a time being Australian Peter Grester for reporting on the ousting of Egypt's democratically elected Islamic government. I am best known as a sports writer. Sport is adult make-believe. Mostly, I choose to believe. Sport for me is like a holiday from the real world. But sooner or later, to the real world I must return. I have spent my journalistic career trying to tell good news. That is, standing witness to the good in the world. My aim has never been to make good news nor to enhance or exaggerate it, certainly not to trivialise or sentimentalise it, but merely to record its often unremarkable presence in the world. I see this as my contribution to our collective mental health. But I have never thought we should or could afford to ignore the bad news of the world, and periodically, whether we like it or not, we are all ripped awake to some appalling brutality or institutionalised wrongdoing. What I know is that there are people who will die to get that story to the world. That is my faith.